hard, hard job, but it gets into your blood and I, you really enjoy doing it. First snowfall, they would have to haul in all the oil and beef, put in the, they had a shack there for the beef, and of course eggs and all that kind of stuff, they had to haul in and get ready for winter, long winter, very long winter. <laughs> My goodness, that truck could it'd make it down from the mine with chains on all four wheels. Clink, 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 clink. They'd come into town and everybody in town would say, here comes Frank, it's time for him to come home. To me, I think that the phone line was so important because once a week or once a day I could talk with my dad and we, even though I was a small child, I knew that, you know, he was in a dangerous position and that phone always gave me the comfort that I needed. I have a very interesting book here, if I can go a little bit. It's called A Barter's Book. You could always tell what, who the person was that was in the barter book because if it was a miner, he'd buy a fifth of whiskey and a plug of tobacco. And if it was a farmer and he had children at home, he would buy some candy, trade for candy. The summers on Log Cabin Mine were really beautiful, just wonderful. And then the winters were, were pretty, pretty rough on everyone. But I never did hear any of the miners complain. In 1890, the uh, first gold was discovered here in the uh, Lee Vining area, which later became the Log Cabin Mine. Jim Simpson and his brother John Simpson, while they were eating lunch, a squirrel was digging around there, and, they, and uh, Jim Simpson thought he saw some sparkling coming out of you know, this ground where this, this squirrel was digging. And he went over to investigate where the squirrel was digging and it had to have little gold in it. And I understand that's how the Simpson mine got started. In 1909, the Simpson brothers found the, the uh, vein that later became the log cabin mine. They operated the mine here on a limited basis using probably what were the early buildings, the log cabins that were located here. They later sold their mine in 1930, and that's when the more modern era of mining development took place here. My father was hired by Frank Garbett in 1939 as the general superintendent of the log cabin mine. Um, he had many responsibilities up here, but he came up in 1940. The mine ran full tilt, 1940, 41, 42. The milling records are matter record. A lot of gold was taken out of here, and during that time, it was the largest gold producing mine in the state of California. Now, the mine shut down during World War II by executive order. They reopened it in 1946, and the mine was worked in 46, 47, and 48, but the tonnage gradually decreased. And then in 1948, it became not profitable for Frank Garbutt to run the mine full tilt. So from then on, it's really been a maintenance operation, but keeping this mine in complete readiness, the price of gold to go up from $32 an ounce and it would have been running full tilt in two days because it was ready. I'm standing in front of the uh, bunkhouse of the log cabin mine, which housed up to 72 men. You can imagine if 72 men uh, working round the clock, three shifts, this place was a buzz. They had to be supplied with food and uh, other necessities. Those were brought up by truck uh, in the summer, and they were, they were from the uh, Levining area, also uh, from the local ranchers in the Mono Basin. But in the winter, uh, the supplies would have to be transported up 
on people's backs on snowshoes in snow drifts as high as 25 feet. As we have seen, there is much heavy equipment up here and much uh, construction, for instance, the head frame, the gallus frame. All this heavy equipment was brought up in trucks up the hill by Gus and Billy Hess. We had to haul timber up there, you know, for the mines. And it's eight by eight timber, you know, long. You know, put them on these trucks and I'd, I'd drive one and we'd go up past this lodge up there, then it gets pretty steep. You start going up there and the, the front end of the car, the truck would go like that. <laughs> kind of scary. <laughs> but finally, I never had no accident, but we always made it, but it get pretty scary sometimes. A lot of the people came into the area wanting to get into the mining business, but they found out that there was more money in selling produce and, and livestock and meat uh, to the miners and or being miners themselves. We on our ranch grew anywhere up to five acres of potatoes also raised in this basin was watermelons, cantaloupes, and uh, a lot of fresh fruit was growing here in the basin. And the people, the miners were just craving uh, that type of food. The log cabin mine shaft was approximately 400 feet deep. There were four levels. Uh, the top three levels were really where the, most of the mining took place, removing the, uh, the gold from the quartz ore. The bottom level, which was uh, it was very wet. The depth of the water was probably about six inches. Uh, it drained out via uh, a long tunnel uh, down the hill, emptied out into uh, Thompson Creek. And um, very cold down there, a lot of water, and uh, hard work. I'm holding on to the bell cable, which runs all the way to the bottom of the mine and runs up topside into the uh, hoist operator's area to a set of bells. This is the only means of communication that we had from the mine uh, to indicate to the hoist operator when to hoist the cars up or the men up and whether to deposit the ore here at the surface and out to the dump or up topside to be processed for gold. I, I got a job there in 1939. I remember this, and I was a mucker. <laughs> the, the miners would go down and, and drill and blast. Then when the air cleared up pretty good, they sent the muckers down in there, and I was one of the muckers to muck this year ore out of there. And they had a big shaft there, and they had four, four levels. And, and, uh, We'd have to go down there and shovel this ore into the car, the little railroad cars they had there, and then push it out the shaft and then take it up and dump it up, you know, in the big bin up there. The ore to be processed for gold was hoisted up to that point up there with a corrugated tin, wheeled over on rails and dumped into this first holding bin which contained a large rock crusher at the bottom, which crushed the rock into a prescribed diameter. Then from there, it went up this long conveyor belt, up to that top, dumped into that storage bin, which contained another rock crusher at the bottom, which further crushed the rock into probably half inch diameter. It, from there, it went on a conveyor belt up to the mill, to the ball mill. The ore containing the gold was fed into the ball mill, which was a huge rotating drum with probably about 750 steel balls continually grinding the ore. 
and water was added, and what came out the other side of the ball mill was a slurry, which of course contained the gold. This slurry was run over a series of plates that were coated with quicksilver. And this, this process went on for a continual 48 hours. At the end of that time, the mill would shut down, these plates would be scraped with the quicksilver and the gold combined. This mixture would be placed in a big iron container or urn, roasted, if you will, over a fire uh, to a certain temperature for so many hours. The quicksilver boiled off. What was left was the proverbial pot of gold. That was boxed up in a design fashion uh, by my father, sealed, and these were all done under regulations, Bureau of Mines. That box then went down the hill with my father driving, uh, two shotgun guards guarding him. It was deposited at the U.S. Post Office in Levining, and from there it went to the Mint. They were happy to have a job in those days, and uh, the going rate was $4 an hour. During the winter, uh, the wives were, were down here with our families, and we had no help in the deep snows, and we had to fend for ourselves. And quite often, the phones to the mine were out, but we, we just were used to taking care of our own problems, and everything went along fine. The way that people lived in those days, it, it was a hard life for a lot of those miners. Like you said, they worked hard, and they lived hard, and they played hard. I played a trumpet, my, my brother played a saxophone, my sister played the piano, my dad played a French horn, and uh, we had to get a drummer, outside drummer, and a banjo player. And we made music every Saturday night. All those miners, CC camp, they all got together. Of course, they all start drinking. Question I asked my dad one time, uh, what did he do for fun? And he says, work, work. I says, oh, you must have did something. He says, well, on Friday nights, we'd go to Mono Inn and we'd have a big dinner and then we'd play cards and then we'd dance until four o'clock in the morning, then go back to the ranch and sleep two hours and do our chores. And then Saturday evening, we'd ride back into the Levining and attend the dance and the party in Levining. 